truly historic in the sense of first ever unprecedented wartime visit by an American president uh, to Israel. Uh, Biden was on the ground for roughly seven hours. He got off Air Force One. You can see him there. And he was uh, embracing Prime Minister Netanyahu. He held a meeting uh, with the prime minister and the unity government's war cabinet. I wanted to be here today uh, for a simple reason. I want the people of Israel, the people of the world, to know where the United States stands. The world sees that support and the moral clarity that you have demonstrated from the moment Israel was attacked. You've rightly drawn a clear line between the forces of civilization and the forces of barbarism. Hard. Pre President Biden also discussed the American government's commitment to Israel and against its commitment against any acts of terrorism. I want you to know you're not alone. You are not alone. As I emphasized earlier, we will continue to have Israel's back as you work to defend your people. The president also used some of his very limited or precious time on the ground to do something that fits in with one of the priorities for the United States and the Biden administration, which is both dealing with and keeping a focus on the hostage crisis. Uh, there is a war afoot, and there is also an open and ongoing severe hostage crisis. It was emotional, survivors, families, missing relatives, as well as first responders who were the first people to have to deal and face off with the Hamas terror attack. And we were there in the first moments seeing the atrocities, little babies that were torn around, tw 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 taken away from their parents, murdered in front of their parents. We're so proud that you, the President of the United States, came here to Israel to support this country. You uplifted the whole spirit in this country. That is just a short excerpt of some of what the president did, the governmental side, the humanitarian side, dealing with the hostage side, all of this a big part of what the president wanted to try to achieve in one day in wartime Israel. He also spoke uh, to the individuals alongside Secretary Blinken. I'm convinced that more people know your responses to what's happening as opposed to just what war and peace is about. The more they're going to be kind of embrace, embrace Israel. The president then concluded the key part of the visit by making a statement there. We mentioned to you tonight that we just learned there will be a Oval Office address to the nation, as many gird for what could be a long haul here and a heightened threat level and an issue that affects so many people in this ongoing crisis. But the president took what many people view as this one of these presidential leadership moments, these tests, to make sure that he reiterated, clarified, and was 100 percent on the issue of condemning the terrorism. There's no rationalizing it, no excusing it, period. The brutality we saw would have cut deep anywhere in the world, but it cuts deeper here in Israel. We will not stand by and do nothing again. Not today, not tomorrow, not ever. Biden boarded Air Force One and began a long flight back home. Uh, we heard from reporting on the ground. Now we turn to Aaron David Miller, uh, Miller Middle East peace negotiator, a State Department veteran. Uh, many different aspects to this, uh, as I emphasize in our reporting. Uh, big picture, what did you think of what the President of the United States conveyed in this unprecedented visit to a wartime Israel? Uh, first of all, Ari, thanks for having me. It really was an extraordinary, extraordinary moment. The uh, president was in Ukraine, of course, but this was rather remarkable, and I think he had three objectives. Number one, uh, provide hope, reassurance, and leadership to a nation that is grieving and has come to doubt, I suspect, uh, its own political leaders. Number two, work with the Israeli government to try to figure out a way to stabilize a bridge of humanitarian assistance uh, into southern Gaza, where you have hundreds of thousands of people under-resourced and underserved. Um, that's a, a, a critically important um, point that he made, and I'm hoping in the days ahead that the Rafa crossing will open. And the third issue, which I think is the toughest, 
was to have a very frank conversation with the prime minister and uh, the prime minister's war cabinet about the nature of what the Israelis are going to do on the ground, their objectives, the implications, the consequences. And I think he referred uh, obliquely, not so obliquely, in his remarks to 9-11 and warned of the dangers of acting on the basis of, ra of rage. And I think that conversation um, may have had some impact in um, perhaps shaping, to some degree, uh, what we may see play out in coming days and, uh, and and weeks. It's a moment of leadership, and this man who has extraordinary commitment to the state of Israel, mm -hmm. deeply Im embedded in his political and emotional DNA, uh, showed that leadership and, and showed Israel. He talks about the, quote, black hole of loss. That's Joe Biden personally reflecting on his own history of family tragedies. Yeah. He related with, to the survivors, yeah. to the hostage families, and to the people of Israel. Yeah, you, you point uh, our attention to the invocation as well as the warning about making policy uh, coming out of these type of searing experiences, including 9-11. Here is what, uh, and this is new, what the president said about that. Shock, pain, rage, an all-consuming rage. I understand and many Americans understand. But I caution this while you feel that rage. Don't be consumed by it. After 9-11, we were enraged in the United States. While we sought justice and got justice, we also made mistakes. Uh, walk us through why, why you mentioned that, what's important about that, especially because uh, for those who studied uh, the use of terrorism, which is a tactic that has risen, uh, specifically aligned with uh, certain uh, subset uh, movements that claim to be Muslim or claim to have a militant ideology, although we've had many conversations about uh, what they do and don't represent. But the tactic which has risen uh, is precisely designed uh, to engender not only a response, but, but potentially um, uh, a grievous or disproportionate response. You know, 9-11 leading to the two longest wars in American history, where the where the standard of victory probably was never could we win, but when could we leave? I think Biden probably amplified that theme in private with the prime minister. Look, 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 Gary, what, what are the Israelis facing? 2.3 million in Gaza, population density, 21,000 humans per square mile, a tunnel system which at 300 miles is half, half the size of the New York subway system. A Hamas that is clearly prepared with IEDs, booby traps, um, to to meet an Israeli force, and then of course, and I'm sure the president raises with the prime minister, what about the day after? Assume the Israelis achieve their objective, decapitating Hamas, destroying its its military infrastructure. Then the question, of course, is what comes next? And I think that conversation is critically important. I think the president had it. And frankly, he's built up so much currency based on trust and confidence that I think he could deliver it. Whether or not the Israelis are thinking this through, rethinking it, I think they already know the risks and implications uh, of a massive ground war. And we can expect something, I think, in the days and weeks ahead. But it's not entirely clear now precisely how large, what the depth and what the breadth of the Israeli operation is going to be. Thank you.